You ready? Let's talk about creativity. Okay, I'd like for you to start by looking at your fingertip, your fingerprint, and just notice the small details of your fingerprint. Now we know that everybody's fingertip is completely different. And yet, if all of us have five fingers, then we all have similar five fingers, similar bones, not so different skin. And when we look, there's this unique feature. Now, if I were a criminal and I had committed a heinous crime and some forensic uh, detective was looking for fingerprints, they could lift my fingerprints off of a glass and see who I was. Well, if you do that, they don't look in their database for every single fingerprint that's ever been recorded. What they do is they look for a pattern. And if you look at your fingertip, you'll see spirals and whirls, kind of like whirl, W-H-I-R-L, but with an O. And your spirals and whirls are in a unique pattern, but everybody has those spirals and whirls. So what happens in creativity is that each of you was born creative, but as you've grown up and things have changed for you and your life experiences are different, the nature versus nurture aspect of creativity comes into play. Were you born creative? Are you made creative by your environment? So the patterns and whirls that are on your fingertip will show that, yes, you, you were born creative, but it could be that the creativity was knocked out of you and that even though it's evident in your unique features, it's not evident in your life. If you feel like when you try to do something creative, you feel like you're a third grader, it's because that's the point at which public school kills your creativity. If you think about it, little kids are real creative. They sing, they draw, they dance, they play with things, they invent games, and they go to kindergarten and they're excited to have the ability to sing and dance and they learn by um, touching and feeling things. By the time you go through the third grade, you're at the point where you're socialized to care what other people think. And whereas before I could put a crayon in your hand and you would happily scribble and I would have to come up to you and go, oh, little Michelle, that's so nice. What is it? And I go, it's mommy, it's daddy. And it's just a scribble. At one point, I look at what everybody else is doing and I draw a square with a triangle on it. And my teacher comes around and goes, oh, that's so nice. It's a house. And I'm beaming. It's like, yes, it's a house. And then she gives me a picture of an acorn. And I color that acorn yellow and green and, and kind of, you know, other colors. And she comes back and she goes, mm -mm -mm -mm. acorns are brown, even though I've seen yellow and green acorns. So by the time you hit third grade, you're taught this means house. This means acorn. You must do it this way. And STEM, science, technology, engineering, and math has taken over your life. So that for the last 12 years, you've been brainwashed into thinking, rational thinking, and STEM is the best way to think. Now, if you think about what's really important to you in life, really important, it's probably not very rational. Now, it's not irrational, but it might be emotional, heartfelt, visionary, imaginative, hopeful. Hope, imagination, feelings are not STEM. You're supposed to take them out. So here's what happens. You're born with equal capacity to be a critical thinker and a creative thinker. But the school system has said critical thinking is super important. Analytical thinking is so important. And we're not going to educate you in creative thinking or educate you in feelings or educate you in imagination or vision. We're just not going to do it. And it reminds me of a movie, uh, The Lady in the Water, I think it was, but there's a character and he's a real fun character. He builds one side of his body with bodybuilding. Like he's working his muscles, he's working his legs, and he is real buff on one side of his body. And he never works out the other side of his body. So it's puny and it's dangly. And he's a really interesting character because 
only one side of him has developed. Well, the creative side of you has been underdeveloped since the third grade. And yet that's the area of greatest potential. Now, when I say creativity, I don't just mean singing, dancing, and drawing. If I have a CEO and I say, oh, you should be creative, I don't expect him to come in and sing the annual report to the board of directors. But he can be creative in how he has a vision forward for the uh, company, or he can be creative, not with the bookkeeping, but in engaging the board of directors. So if you think about athletes, they can be creative in how they play the game. Chefs can be creative. Uh, neurosurgeons create a plan for each unique surgery that they do. So what we're gonna do in this class is really look at your creativity. And instead of saying STEM is everything, we're gonna say STEM needs STEAM, science, technology, engineering, arts, and math, okay? So let me tell you a bit about creativity in the broad sense, not art, in the broad sense, okay? They've done thousands of studies of creative individuals in psych and sociology and business and entrepreneurship, thousands of studies because creativity is so valuable and it actually fuels the economy. So what is this value of having vision or being creative? And when they study thousands of creative individuals, the Steve Jobs, the you know Michael Jordans, they found that overall there's four distinct stages of a process that you go through. Now, just like your fingerprint goes back and forth and back and forth and then goes into a whirl or spiral, you may not go through these stages cleanly or easily. You may be blocked during some of these stages. You may start with one stage and go to another before the process starts. Mostly, if you try to be creative and you can't, it's because this process has been blocked or you've been trained not to use it. So here is the process that they found highly creative people go through. And it's four stages. And I want you to remember it as S-I-D-A. S-I-D-A. She is a dumb ass. Now that is a displaced code because I just said something taboo and you're like, she's a dumb ass and you laugh. That will make it stick better. Okay. S-I-D-A. That's why I said it that way. The first stage, you need to know this and think about what you did. Saturation. Saturation means soaking up ideas in as many ways as possible. Now, if you're given an assignment to write a paper and you go online and you research it and you write it, you look at Wikipedia and what somebody else wrote and you write it, it's not going to be creative. When I say saturate in as many ways as possible, soak it up in as many ways as possible, it's like this. I have to analyze a Shakespearean character. I uh, read the cliff notes, I go to Wikipedia and I write this boring paper. If maybe I'm an actor and I wanna analyze this character creatively, I might read the play, I might act out the play, I might look up the stage that they used for this play. I might rewrite it in contemporary English. I might think about what music did this character listen to? Did this character dance? What kind of dancing did this character do? What kind of underwear does this character wear? Now you're like, underwear, that's kind of weird. Well, if I'm in a very tight corset and my body is bound up and I'm female, I might deliver that soliloquy in a very different way than if I'm wearing a burlap sack. So the way that you soak up information is very, very important. Some of you soak up information in very different ways. For instance, some of you soak up information by talking to other people. You get on the phone, you talk, you text somebody, you message somebody, you discord somebody. And by talking to a lot of people about your ideas, you saturate. Some of you are like, shut up. I don't want to talk to anybody while I'm trying to like get an idea. I want to sit alone in a room and maybe 
read books and look online and pace around and go for a walk and I soak up information in different ways. However, you've been taught to only soak up information in certain ways. Like you read a book, you go online, you watch a video. If you can think of different ways to soak up information, you will be much more creative. The cool thing about this process is you don't have to worry about what you're going to create at the end. Because if you don't go through this process, it won't happen. If you go through saturation, it's going to naturally trigger this process. Um, so you might need to get your hands on materials. You might need to um, think about it from another angle. The more you saturate, the better you will be able to do it. Okay. Now, once you saturate and you soak it up in however many ways you can, the next stage is incubation. Like a baby is in an incubator or you put an egg in an incubator. Just like saturation sounds like soaking it up in a sponge. Incubation is you let it simmer. You don't know what's going on. And what happens to you physiologically is this. When you saturate, your brain is taking in information and it's soaking it up and you're filling up your mind with as much as you can hold. And there gets to be a point where your conscious brain just can't handle it. It's just like, oh my God, I need to take a break. In classes, I often try to saturate you. I throw ideas out, I talk a lot, I show pictures, I write things, I do videos because I'm trying to get you to soak it up in as many ways as possible. And there's a point in my class where you zone out and you're just like, oh my God, I can't take her anymore. I can't listen to this anymore. I can't watch the video anymore. And you just zone out. It may be if you write a paper and you've been doing a lot of research or a lot of studying, there's a point where you just have to get up and go do the dishes or take a walk or suddenly you have to watch TV. In incubation, what happens is your conscious mind can't take it anymore and it hasn't solved the problem yet so it dumps it into your unconscious now when i say unconscious people think in the u.s that if you're unconscious you're like mm, you know passed out but in reality your unconscious is doing a lot all the time we might have heard that the brain only uses about four percent of its energy at any one time that's your conscious brain working, just 4%. There is no organ in your body where 96% of the time it does nothing. Your unconscious, that extra 96%, is controlling your breathing, is controlling your appetite, your heartbeat. And so you don't have to think consciously about breathing or your heart beating or digesting the food. It's happening unconsciously. When I have an emotional reaction, I can't think my way through, I will now be angry. I will now fall in love. Boom, it hits you because emotions come from your unconscious. Now, not only is all my body memory, my body actions, my hunger, my heart rate, my eyes blinking, all of that is in my unconscious. My emotions are in my unconscious. You, when you're asleep and unconscious, you dream. Dreaming is unconscious. You are dreaming right now. Now, I know that sounds funny, but a lot of you just go daydreaming. What's happening is I'm engaging you. I'm like, hey, 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 look here. Listen to my voice. And your conscious brain is like, okay, this 4% is listening. But your unconscious never turns off and you're actually dreaming all the time. So that's why it's easy to zone out or dream, daydream a little bit, or you might fall into a reverie and have these memories come back. So your unconscious has all your dreams. We know that dreams are composed of different bits of information. Your unconscious contains everything you've ever seen, heard, or done. Right now, your unconscious is taking in the entire screen of all the people. And you may be watching my eyes or my mouth or my head, but you can see every hair on my head. You can see everything in the background. 
I can see everything in everybody's background here. I can see your eyelashes, but I would go insane if I had to keep track of it all consciously. So I filter it out and it goes into my unconscious. Your unconscious has been working since before you were born. And so all of your prenatal memories, all of your memories and feelings and experiences as a kid, the first time you saw a sunrise or a sunset, the first time that you had a kiss, all of that is stored in your unconscious. They say that your unconscious is a, is a promiscuous cesspool. <laughs> and what that means is you got all this stuff in there and your conscious brain tries to organize it. But just like in dreams, your unconscious is just like randomly sticking stuff together because there's so much there and it will do all kinds of interesting connections. So what happens is when you saturate and your conscious mind, your filter can't take anymore, it dumps all of the memories and ideas into your unconscious and your unconscious starts kind of playing around with it and you're not aware of it. You know that there's a paper you have to finish or a project you want to finish, but you have to get up and walk away, which is why you might suddenly go, man, I'm hungry. I need to eat because the information has gone into your unconscious. Your unconscious connects it to like digesting food. You might suddenly twitch and need to get up and walk. Your unconscious is saying, I need to move your body in order to process this. So it's not unusual when you're incubating to feel frustrated and upset and disgusted because those are emotions or uh, bored and you need to move around. So when we're incubating, we do things that the unconscious controls a little more. We zone out and watch a movie. We drive somewhere and we zone out. Consciously, I should be paying attention to where I'm driving, but I'm sure you've had that experience of, you know, you've been thinking about a problem while you're driving and suddenly you're like, oh, where am I? Did I miss my turn? That's your unconscious kicking in because your conscious mind relaxes. You might take a shower, be falling asleep, uh, be working out, be watching a movie, anything where your conscious mind kind of goes a little bit and your unconscious mind is like, okay, let's move, walk, feel, eat, do something different. Eventually your unconscious goes, whoa, okay, here's a connection. And you have the third stage, the discovery stage. The discovery stage is your aha moment. So you'll be taking a shower, you'll be going for a walk, or you'll be driving and watching a movie and you zone out. And then suddenly you go, I know what I want to do. I, I, I know the answer to that. I got to get back to it. That aha moment only lasts for a second. And it's very interesting to me when I'm in class with people, because when the unconscious delivers it to the conscious mind, your unconscious and your conscious can't confront each other. You go kind of crazy. There's got to be your unconscious kind of slips it in under the door for your conscious to find out. When I'm in class, I love it because a student suddenly go like this, like sit up, or their eyes will get big. Or if they're really quiet and I look in their eyes, their pupils will even dilate because there's this <gasps> moment. So when your unconscious finally makes this weird connection and you understand what you want to do, you get uh, your unconscious kind of brings it up to your consciousness with a light bulb going off and you'll feel this little bit of energy from it. The next stage after discovery is application. Now, there's a big difference between being imaginative and creative. Imaginative is you can do it in your head and you're just imagining things. And it's like, oh, it'd be cool to do this or that. Well, imagination doesn't really take root in the real world. So creativity means you have to make something new and useful new and useful. If it's not useful, it's just bizarre. I can imagine all kinds of stuff and I might make something, but if it's truly bizarre, it's not creative. It's just like not even useful. It's just, I'm crazy, right? So in the application, I take that aha moment of discovery, that eureka moment of discovery, and I put it to work. And I 
write down my ideas, I begin the project, I come back to the poem or song, if I'm practicing on my guitar, I suddenly know how to do it, right? If you don't apply it, you cut off the process, okay? And when you cut off the process, it gets a little bit warped. So you have to at least write it down or start it. What's cool about the application, like you come back to it, is that it starts saturating all over again. I study for what I want to do in this paper. I walk away and, you know, play basketball and I suddenly on the way home know what I want to do. I imagine how it's going to go and then I get it started. Once I apply it, it's like this nice loop. When I apply it and start writing, I'm saturating all over again because I'm taking it to the next level of thinking about it. Now, the place you are most likely to get stuck is an incubation. Saturation is not bad, like you soak up ideas. If you don't soak up ideas really well and deeply, you will not move to the next stage. So many people just saturate badly, go from saturation to application. I look it up online, I do my paper, I'm pressed for time. And so it's not creative. If you really saturate in a lot of different ways, uh, we're doing perspective and drawing class. If I draw, watch the video, look at buildings, draw on top of photographs, see videos, the more I see perspective from different ways, if I saturate a lot, I will naturally go into incubation. So the first step is you don't really saturate, you just do it in a boring way. Step number two is when it goes into incubation and it goes into your unconscious, because these um, emotions come up and because your unconscious is kind of challenging your conscious, you get this thing called the V-O-J. And the voice of judgment says, this is stupid. You don't know how to do it. You're going to fail. Everybody will laugh at you if you do this. You think you can play guitar? Psh, you better not do this in public. You think you can write a poem? Oh, this is stupid. You have tons of projects that you haven't finished. Your teacher will flunk you because this isn't what the teacher wanted. The voice of judgment is not a voice of reason. Hmm, I need to edit this paper. Hmm, I could use feedback. That's a voice of reason. The voice of judgment is a voice in your head that says you're stupid and not good enough. It can be very interesting to listen to your voice of judgment because a lot of times it's somebody else's voice your mother's, my ex-husband's. It's like somebody saying, you are not worthy of having this great idea. And psychologists say it's because creativity kind of threatens the normal because it's coming up with something new and different. And just like that new thing coming up the block is kind of like your dogs start barking at this intruder. <laughs> this is something new. I don't know how to do this. So your voice of judgment will tell you it's not good enough or you don't know how, or this is stupid. I need to go do the dishes. The dishes are more important than this. That's your voice of judgment. It happens during incubation. And it's probably one of your biggest foes to creativity. The other thing that can happen is that you have that moment of discovery and you never capture it. You just imagine something, but you don't write it down or try to apply it in any way. Studies have shown that if you respect your creativity and give it some space, it will flourish. So when you have a discovery, even if you have like a notebook where you write it down or a nightstand where you keep your ideas, um, a sketchbook where you keep your ideas, a drawer full of stuff, um, you go into your room and practice on your guitar. If you need to have a place for the application to happen, and if you don't, you have a bad relationship with your creativity. In my workshops, I often say it like this. If I had a friend 
that I said, oh, you know what? You're really stupid. Everybody's going to laugh at you. I don't have time for you. I got to do the dishes instead of spend time with you because the dishes are more important. That friend would be like, screw you and leave and never come back. Or you've been taught to treat your creativity that way. Uh, your creativity is going to make you look stupid. Your creativity is going to be like, nobody's going to care. Your creativity is not important. The dishes are more important. And because you've been taught to teach your creative side like that, while upholding your critical thinking side, your creative side, you may think you don't have it anymore. But the truth is, it's just terribly wounded and doesn't know how to emerge. So in the application stage, it's very important to respect those ideas and at least write them down or at least you know, sing the song, the end of the song, or practice the end of the guitar. If you have a new move in sports, you know, go in and like, you know, throw a few hoops because you're creating a new way of playing the game. So saturate in as many ways as possible. When you incubate, be aware of what you're doing and don't listen to your VOJ. During incubation, one way to get past your VOJ is to laugh at it until it shut up. But I'll do things like if I have a drawing I'm working on and I'm stuck, I'll leave it somewhere where I can see it. And I might walk by a doorway and just glance in and yeah, it's there. If I'm uh, writing a chapter in a book, I'll leave it open and I won't put it away because in my unconscious, I wanna remind my unconscious that I respect my creativity and I want it to happen. So, after saturating in as many ways as possible during incubation, if you can shut up the voice of judgment and then leave the project out enough so that when you're washing the dishes, it's in the corner of your eye. During the discovery moment, that's just going to happen and it feels great. And to kind of go, oh my God, I have a discovery that respects it. But then to respect it by applying it by just even for a few minutes, taking that idea and making it real. Now, that's the intro to creativity. And I am hoping that as I talk to you, that you may have thought, oh, I did that. There was something I did when I made that photograph. Or there was something I did the last time I tried to, you know, create a meal or create a 